Welcome to worship. Lord, we come before your throne of grace, not trusting in ourselves, but in your marvelous and gracious love as it seeks expression among us. May we listen for your still small voice as it speaks to us today and as it boldly proclaims the undeniable reality of your love that will not let us go. Stir our hearts and our imaginations that we may see beyond appearances of what is to the reality of what can be. In the name and spirit of the Holy Child, Jesus our Lord, we pray. Amen. The reading this morning is the story of the martyrdom of Stephen. It comes from Acts chapter 6. Now during those days, when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the twelve called together the whole community of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the word. What they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicorar, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. The word of God continued to spread, the number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Stephen, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and others of those from Cilicia and Asia, stood up and argued with Stephen, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. 
Then they secretly instigated some men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people, as well as the elders and the scribes. Then they suddenly confronted him, seized him and brought him before the council. They set up fault witnesses who said, This man never stops saying things against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses handed on to us. And all who sat in the council looked intently at him, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Then the high priest asked him, Are these things so? And Stephen replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our ancestor Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Our ancestors had the tent of testimony in the wilderness, as God directed when he spoke to Moses, ordering him to make it according to the pattern he had seen. Our ancestors, in turn, brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our ancestors. And it was there until the time of David, who found favor with God and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the house of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made with human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, and now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You are the ones that received the law as ordained by angels, and yet you have not kept it. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God but they covered their ears and with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. Here ends the reading. Today's scripture reading from the book of Acts tells the story of Stephen, the very first martyr for the Christian faith. Stephen's feast day is December 26th, which is why the carol about good King Wenceslas refers to Stephen. It is the day after Christmas Day. It is said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The church father Tertullian is the first to make this now famous, if somewhat disturbing, observation. The fact that some people have always been prepared to die rather than deny their Christian convictions attracts people. Maybe because people become interested in figuring out why the faith is so compelling that people are willing to sacrifice their very lives rather than renounce their faith. Faithfulness unto death sounds noble. The book of Revelation says, Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. But the reality of martyrdom is, is messy. In the first hundred years of the church, before Constantine, the Roman emperor, adopted it as the official faith of Rome, church leaders developed a practice of 
penance, sometimes called reconciliation, for those who commit serious sins, including the sin of apostasy, that is, the sin of renouncing the faith or of practicing some other faith. The reality is, during some of the periods of persecution of members of the church during the Roman Empire before the adoption of Christianity, some church members renounce their faith or go through the motions of worshiping the Roman emperor in order to preserve their own lives. These Christians often did this for perfectly noble and understandable reasons. Often they needed to stay alive in order to continue to support and care for their families, for example. Reconciliation or penance is still a sacrament in the modern Roman Catholic Church, but it has changed significantly from the early days of the church. Generally, nowadays, if penance is prescribed, it's quick and easy. Forgiveness is a foregone conclusion in many cases, if not most. In the early church, penance is serious. Penance is prescribed for very serious sins, such as murder, adultery, or, as I mentioned previously, apostasy, renouncing the faith. A person could only go through penance once after being baptized, and this fact caused some people to postpone baptism until fairly late in their lives, in case they would need to do penance for some reason. Both paths, the path of martyrdom and also the path of sin, penance, and reconciliation, both of these paths have led to the church that we have today. Those who remained faithful unto death, sacrificing all for the church, and also those who compromised their beliefs or who fell into sin and then later repented, both of these types of people are part of our heritage and still part of who we are today as a church. In the modern church, redemption stories can actually attract more people than stories of saintly modern martyrs. Some preachers and writers who came to fame claiming to have sketchy criminal past before a dramatic conversion have been exposed as frauds. Such was the case with Mike Warnke, whose fabrications of being a dangerous Satanist were exposed by a pair of Christian journalists. This was after he had been making a living off of his fake former sinning persona for over a decade. I do know many people who have turned their lives around through an embrace of Christian faith, and you probably do as well. I have also known many pious frauds, people who lie, cheat, and steal, with no intention of ever truly repenting, all the while mouthing pious declarations of their faith. Jesus told us to beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. It's always good to bear in mind the words of Jesus when judging the people we know. You will know who they truly are by the fruits that they bear. People who are truly redeemed are certainly not perfect by any means, but they do manage to walk their talk with a fair amount of consistency. But the scripture lesson for today is not about a sinner who turns his life around. Instead, it is about a saint who is faithful and sacrificial unto his own untimely death. So what is the wisdom for us today in the persistent sacrificial faith of Stephen, the very first Christian martyr? This passage encourages us to consider seriously and deeply the value of sacrifice. You may never be called upon to sacrifice your life for a cause that you value, but you will regularly be asked to sacrifice in pursuit of a greater good. Sacrifices such as time, money, and status can do a great deal of good, 
especially if these sacrifices are thoughtful and timely ones. So what is sacrifice? Sacrifice is giving up something good for something better. It is important to remember that not every request for sacrifice is a worthy request. And even in the case of those causes that are worthy, it isn't a sacrifice if someone else is controlling how much you give up. I agree with writer Patricia Cornwell that the root of all evil is abuse of power. Forcing others to constantly sacrifice to benefit you is not noble. It's a form of abuse. Any community where sacrifices are way out of proportion, where one person or maybe a small group does not sacrifice, but they benefit from many sacrifices made by others, that's not healthy. This is not just true in religious communities. It's true in any setting. But being part of a functional and healthy community requires members to make sacrifices. Again, not all sacrifices are healthy. Healthy relationships don't require you to sacrifice things like your friends and family, your dreams, or your dignity. I agree with Henry Link, who says that no discovery of modern psychology is so important as its scientific proof of the necessity of self-sacrifice, or in other words, discipline, to self-realization and happiness. Doing good does you good. Evidence shows that helping others can have a positive effect on your own mental health and well-being. It turns out that being unselfish is the best way to be selfish. Moments of serious sacrifice are rare. And for most of us, these moments tend to occur suddenly and unexpectedly. The way to prepare for an occasion that calls for making a big sacrifice is for us to consistently make small sacrifices to help others as part of our daily lives. Sacrifice and the corresponding virtue of humility aren't built on giant gestures as much as they are forged with consistent, thoughtful actions of an everyday nature. For a final word for today's sermon, I'm going to close with the words of the famous track star, Jesse Owens. Championships are mythical. The real champions are those who live through what they are taught in their homes and churches. The attitude that we've got to win in sports must be changed. Teach your youngsters who are the future hope of America, the importance of love, respect, dedication, determination, self-sacrifice, self-discipline, and good attitude. That's the road up the ladder to the championships. And now let us pray for ourselves, for one another, and for our world during our time of prayer, beginning with silent prayer. God of love, you call us to make sacrifices. During this past year, many of us have made enormous sacrifices. We have given up a great deal for a greater good. God, be with us, guide us, teach us which sacrifices are good and healthy. Help us to build up our own lives our families and our communities through a healthy 
self-sacrificial love for one another and for those in our lives. Amen. And now with the confidence that comes from knowing we are children of God, let us join in the prayer our Savior taught us saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Amen.